Excellent. All right, perfect. team. Perfect, perfect. So Dan and I, Dan the man, which camera Ooh. are we going on? We're going on my camera. There we're over right. here. Oh, over here. Look over there. Look at us together. Homeboys right here. <laughs> This guy, uh, number one, we're breaking our COVID rules because um, he and I have been hanging out together nonstop, yeah. doing physical therapy and all that for the last eight months. So At least. the guy works on me all the time. Eight years. Eight years, that's true, <laughs> more than eight months. Uh, so today, the ball and socket. Oh, I forgot the intro. There it is. This is Dan's walk-up music. I'm gonna make sure we got his walk-up music. I blew it, and the applause. <laughs> Hey, Danimal the Animal, ladies and gentlemen. Dan McLean. <laughs> All right. Let's get rolling. All right, Danny. Um, welcome, everybody, to the show. Uh, we are very excited to have you here. Having, um, having the experience of being a ball and socket joint uh, physical limitation individual, I've had some shoulder injuries of late. I've had uh, three hip replacements and arthroscopies and a lot there. Um, there's no better person that I wanted to bring in to help me do this presentation. Really, Dan's going to kind of do it all, but he's going to take you guys through um, from kind of the basic entry levels of understanding the joints, the biomechanics, the anatomy, and then a little bit more advanced as we go through. And these are a lot of the practices and a lot of the things that uh, I've learned from him over the years of rehabilitating myself. And then we are able to kind of transfer that on to our clientele. So uh, he's the man. He's exactly the person Every time you guys hear in all the courses and all the webinars I give, when I say, oh, I've been talking to Dan or Dan's been helping me with this client, this is the guy, Dan. Dan is our, our therapist. His wife, Lisa, is also a physical therapist and has worked with us on quite a few of our clients. Also worked with Keegan and my wife and myself, too, with some of our limitations. So um, they're, they're a family of knowledge, and we're very happy, number one, to have them in our lives. Number two, uh, to, to call them friends and, uh, and co-colleagues. Uh, to help us out with presentations and content like this. So, Dan, you want to give us a, a little a little history of you, uh, what you do, where you're from, where you work at, and plans for for the future a little bit. Yeah, I know yeah. you got some stuff going at results, and then I'll let you take over and run from there. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a, like Rob said, a physical therapist. Um, I've been treating for the past ten years. Um, you know, going back to college, I was a collegiate athlete, so I played basketball in college. Um, played at D2 in San Francisco State. Um, so that's kind of where I was first or originally introduced to strength and conditioning principles. Um, wasn't very good strength and conditioning principles, as is, uh, you know, a lot of D2s and junior colleges, you have your assistant uh, coach who is your strength coach. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it really kind of sparked my interest. I worked as an aide at a physical therapy clinic while I was doing my undergrad in San Francisco um, and kind of saw this this need to uh, continue rehab uh, beyond the limitations of insurances and all that stuff. So I was able to do some personal training during that time, went back to my um, uh, JC that I played at before San Francisco State and did some strength and conditioning with those guys too. So um, definitely uh, strength and conditioning is, is my background. I wanted to get into physical therapy. I got hurt at a young age and kind of saw the benefit of that too. So really trying to combine the two strength and conditioning and physical therapy in order to, to treat our patients and uh, having someone like you to help me out with that is has been unremarkable. So well, um, that's been that's been a big part of why um, I was kind of attracted to working with you and referring clients to you was that sport that strength and conditioning background. Like we had we had multiple therapists that we had sent people to that came away with like a different philosophy on how they wanted to rehab their their people. Right. And the majority of them, it was just make make it not hurt anymore. It wasn't to improve performance. Right. And that's really where you sold me. I was like, that's that's the mindset. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for my people. Right. Even though they're not athletes, they're still performing life. Exactly. And so once I saw that and you're, you're not an asshole. So we, <laughs> we got along right there. Sometimes, by the way. sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> so that was easy for us. Uh, it was, I mean, a friendship at first sight kind of thing. I mean, we hit right. it off right away. And right. Um, from you speaking at our uh, NSCA state clinic, you know, during lunchtime doing the FMS, you remember yeah, that? Yeah, that was our sure. first time oh, kind of getting yeah. in there. Yeah. So yeah, that was pretty cool. That's great. Uh, all right. So I'm going to let Dan kind of take over here. We're going to, we're going to screen share his screen. He's got some awesome stuff to show you guys. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna dive deep into this. Um, questions, Dan. Dan likes questions during the presentation. So you guys have uh, something that you, you you know as as he's talking about any specific thing. If you have a question about it, throw it on the the chat. Don't do the Q and A. The the Q and A's don't come up on a shared screen for some reason. 
Uh, if you guys do chat, I am I am uh, monitoring that, and I will ask Dan as we go along. So uh, I'll be moderating there. Anything you guys need, anything you want me to ask him, just give me a holler on the chat, and uh, I'll get his attention. And we'll go there. But Dan, the uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And Rob, thanks again for allowing me to come and and speak with you. You guys, I know you guys are seeing us uh, through through this webinar and Zoom, but his setup here is immaculate. I mean, it's awesome. I kind of walked into the room not knowing what to expect, but this is kind of top-notch stuff. Um, so it's really, really exciting to be a part of this and thank everybody who's viewing. Um, I think we had quite a few, uh, quite a few people register. So thanks for taking your time to kind of hang out with us today. And hopefully we can go through and get you some good information here. Um, really some things that you should be able to take and apply with you today, tomorrow, and in the future. Um, like Rob said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to kind of throw them up on the chat there. We'll answer them as we go. Otherwise, I'm going to be kind of jamming here. We got um, a, kind of a full packed hour here. So we talked about a little bit of my background here with um, collegiate um, basketball and, and strength and conditioning. And some of these um, certifications are things that I've gotten after I got my physical therapy degree to better understand bridging that gap between injury and performance. Um, I'm not sure if many people know about athletes performance. It's now called Exos, but that's where I was first introduced to kind of working together as a team with the orthopedic surgeon, the physical therapist, the nutritionist, massage therapist, strength and conditioning coaches, trainers. So um, it was a really good experience uh, over in, in Florida um, with Dr. James Andrews Institute right next door. So saw all these high level athletes and how to really get them back to full function. Uh, like Rob said, not just getting them out of pain. Um, and then moving forward, Rob and I, I mean, we've, we've been uh, working together over the last decade here now. It's kind of crazy to think about that um, when, I, when I reflect back, but I think we've done a tremendous job of trying to get more of that collegiate setting where you do have the, the doctor, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, the strength coach, all working together as a team. In the outpatient private world, it's a little bit harder to have all those components, um, but I do think we've done a phenomenal job of trying to get people back to their active lifestyle, not just getting them back and out of pain and um, kind of re-injuring themselves in the future. So typically what happens is you have an active person, they go through an injury, they have a surgery, potentially they do some physical therapy and there's, there's some limitations within the, the private sector physical therapy that we're experiencing right now where insurance companies just aren't really reimbursing us the way that they used to. Uh, we have a limited number of visits. So it's becoming more and more important to kind of close this gap that you guys see right here. So before, and this was what I experienced as an aide in a physical therapy clinic. And that's why I started doing personal training with the people after they were done with their, their rehab, because there is still a big gap there. And you can see, we can, we have a big gap in our circle here. So I really honestly think the next phase is going to be more of the personal trainer and the strength coach kind of closing this gap between when physical therapy ends and they return to their active lifestyle, whatever that may be, sports, playing with their kids, um, doing hikes. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different goals people have. So um, really my goal is to really work with these personal trainers, work with the strength and conditioning staff, with the, the college athletes, and really get them back to their full potential after an injury, return them to their full potential. So that's where Rob and I have done a, an excellent job. And maybe one, one day in the future, we can do uh, more of a webinar on that as well and how we can make that team approach that. work. That would be awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, when you do that, you have, you have stories like this guy right here, and this is what we strive to do. You know, I, I get, I get them back to lifting their pink weights like this, and then I send them back over, <laughs> back over to Rob here. So this was one of, uh, Rob's clients, one of my patients here that we worked together closely with over a couple of different injuries. And, um, now he's back to doing everything that he, he loves to do. So it's really been a, a, a great teamwork approach that we have here. So these are some of the objectives that we have for today. Um, we are going to go over the ball and socket joints, which is primarily the shoulder and the hip. There's many other joints in the body, but the shoulder and hip are very, very much the same. We're going to talk about anatomical considerations for movement, and then two considerations for the aging athlete or the aging person, um, and what we can do about that. Okay, so as we go through here, uh, I have a couple of videos that will kind of explain the anatomy a little bit. So if you guys can tune in here. And as you look over the cursor, I'm going to be pointing to different landmarks. So we do have the clavicle here, which is part of the shoulder joint, the acromion making up the AC joint right there that you see. So that's one joint of the shoulder. That's the coracoid right there, which the bicep and the pec attach to, which can affect the scapular position. You see the humerus, the humeral head, obviously that's the ball. 
um, and then the socket it sits in. And you can see kind of like a, a golf ball sitting into a socket there. Um, it's not very deep, it's pretty shallow, the shoulder joint, so there's a lot of movement going on. Um, again, we're going over the coracoid there that can affect the scapular position. As we look at the side view, you can see the, the subacromial space. And this is what we'll talk about when we get into different injuries um, with, with different clients that we see. We look at the back view here um, and we can see the scapula uh, a lot better. The spine of the scapula is a big landmark here because that's what separates some of the rotator cuff muscles. And three of the four rotator cuff muscles originate on the back side of the scapula here. So when we're doing a lot of our rehab exercises or even corrective exercises for that manner, the rotator cuff are extremely important. Um, and as we go through this little video, we're gonna throw on some muscles so you guys can see, but the scapula sits on that thoracic cage. So you can see that if the thoracic cage is a little bit more flexed, it's gonna affect the, the angle of that scapula, which is also gonna affect the socket. So when we talk about the shoulder joint, it's not just the shoulder joint, it's the thoracic spine. It's how the scapula sits on the thoracic spine. It's the AC joint. There's a lot of different factors. Now we're gonna add some muscles here. And this is, you can see the rotator cuff muscles on the back of the, the scapula. So the supraspinatus is up there, the infraspinatus down there, and then we have the teres minor. From the front side, we can kind of see here the subscap. So those are the four muscles of the rotator cuff and they all act together synchronously to compress the joint before movement, right? So that's why it's so important. If there's any dysfunction in the rotator cuff, it really affects the biomechanics of the shoulder. This is the big muscle on the front side of the scapula, the, the subscap muscle. And that's again, one of the four rotator cuff muscles there. You can see as we add more muscles, that's one of the biceps attached to that coracoid can affect tipping of the scapula. And then you see the bicep kind of going through that groove there. So um, there's a lot more to the shoulder. Is this the subscapularis here? Subscapularis is kind of deep, nice. deep in there on the rib cage, okay. yeah. Um, and then we look at the back of the shoulder, you see the triceps coming in right there. So the tricep actually attaches to your scapula as well. So it can affect that tilt as well, but also restrict forward flexion. So um, all that little, all those muscular attachments on the backside of the shoulder, are really important for shoulder flexion. And that's one of the motions that we lose um, as we, as we age a bit. We'll talk a little bit more about that what, later. What is this software called? This is called complete anatomy. So this is a, a really good tool that we use to explain anatomy to patients as as we're going over different injuries. So um, you guys can see the little, the points over on the left hand side. Um, those are kind of the things that we ran through, but just some general anatomy of the shoulder. So we know what we're looking at. Now, this is pretty important for overhead lifting, right? The thoracic spine and how that scapula sits on the thoracic spine. If we are all sitting in our chairs right now, or if you're standing up, you can go ahead and try to elevate your arms overhead and you can feel how that motion is, right? But if you really slouch sit, and you have more of a curvature to your thoracic spine, then try to lift your arms, your arms aren't gonna lift as high. You might feel a little pinch in the top and that's uh, impingement. So all that is, is we're changing the tilting angle of the scapula, which changes the socket portion of the shoulder joint. So uh, by manipulating the thoracic spine, manipulating the scapula, we can really open up motion without having to do a ton of stretching of the actual joint. Um, so that's something that shouldn't be overlooked. If you guys are uh, ever concerned or worried if your thoracic spine is tight or not, obviously posture is a, is a big component of that. But this is a test here that you can do. You take a dowel, place it along your clavicles, rotate from side to side, and normal range of motion is 45 degrees. So she's about 45 degrees right there. If she rotated all the way and that stick was pointing back towards us, that'd be 90 degrees. Um, so 45 degrees is all you need. If you do that one side, it's extension on one side. You do it to the other side, it's extension on the other side. So that's an assessment of thoracic extension there. You know, if we really need a good example of how to reach your arms overhead, I can go get Keegan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if, any, if anybody wants to see that, we can <laughs> definitely. Not to do it. She just sent me the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, the arms overhead. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> So uh, with that overhead lifting, obviously the thoracic spine, we just talked about how important that is and the scapula, how it kind of is coordinated on, on that thoracic spine. The lower trap is a huge muscle in that coordination of the scapula moving along the thoracic spine. Um, and the lower trap, interestingly, interestingly enough, any type of injury that you have, the lower trap and the infraspinatus muscles, those are the first ones that start to atrophy and they start to lose their function. So then your body just doesn't work correctly when those two muscles aren't, aren't functioning, that's where your, your mobility can uh, start to lack. So that's a big emphasis when we're going through the rehab process. So um, if you guys are 
interested to see if that lower trap is functioning correctly, this is a little test that you can do as well. So this is a shoulder elevation test and you can raise your arm up and then you're gonna feel for that inferior angle of your shoulder blade or the scapula. That inferior angle is that little um, knob on the bottom part of your scapula. And we want that to hit the mid axillary line, which is kind of right down there, which I'm showing you guys right there. So this is a quick and easy test. Mm -hmm. If your scapula isn't rotating to that point, then you can, uh, there could be some tightnesses, but that lower trap may not be pulling the scapula down and rotating it out to the side, which again will affect that socket alignment. So a couple easy tests you guys can already, already do there. Okay, so that's the shoulder and kind of some anatomical considerations for the shoulder, right? Um, when we look at the hip, oh, there we go. Took a little second to catch up there. So when we look at the hip, we can use the same software to look at the anatomy of the hip. So you can see the bones of the hip, the lumbar spine comes in right there. Um, there's some attachments of the lumbar spine to the hip, the sacrum, the ilium, the pelvic bone there. You can see the, the femur and how that head kind of sits into the socket. So very similar to the shoulder and how the, the head of the humerus sits into the scapula. So. This is where all that movement occurs. Um, there's a ton of movement in the shoulder. There's a ton of movement in the hip. The hip obviously is, you can see it, the socket is a little deeper in there. So there's not gonna be as much movement in the hip as the shoulder. It needs to be able to bear a ton of weight, right? So um, there is a little bit deeper socket to it. When the socket isn't as deep, that's where people get into trouble. So as we start to add some musculature here, you can see there's some adductor muscles that are coming in a uh, view from the posterior side. We flip around to the anterior side. This is the hip flexor. So um, if you guys can see, and I think I'm, I'm delayed a little bit here, so I'll slow down. Um, there we go. So now we're on the hip flexor. Um, the hip flexor is actually a combination of two muscles, the psoas right there and the, and the iliacus, which is against the hip bone. So they come down the front of the hip and they attach to the femur and generate hip flexion or bringing your knee up towards your up towards your chest, okay? So this muscle is a huge muscle that um, can be in spasm. It gets really tight with sitting. I was just talking to somebody um, about this this morning. We're trying to increase his hip extension. Uh, he sits for six hours a day. I said, well, if we're really gonna make any changes, it's gonna be very difficult to get better hip extension, loosen up your hip flexor if you're sitting that much. So that's where we, we do a little bit of education with our clients or patients. Here's some of the muscles on the outside part of the hip. The glutes kind of come in and similar to the shoulder, whenever you have hip pain, the glutes become inhibited. So that's the glute med. And this is the big glute max muscle right here. Super important for hip extension. But again, if that hip flexor muscle is very tight, it's going to inhibit that hip extension movement and the, the, the maximus muscle is not going to be able to produce that force that it needs to. You guys can see that white stuff going down the side. That's the IT band and the TFL is a muscle that's directly attached to that. So really, um, really thick tissue right there um, so that your hip doesn't kind of fall out of the socket, um, that lateral support. This is some of the, the quad muscles in the front of the hip and you can see how they attach right there. So pretty close proximity to the hip flexor. It can pull on your, your pelvis and rotate it forward. So that's why um, a lot of the times when we sit, um, a lot of times when we're doing a lot of squatting motions, lunging motions, the quads get really tight. It can affect that, that pelvic tilt which just throws all the muscles off and their, their uh, length tension relationship gets a little affected, thus inhibiting them. So um, as we go a little bit deeper into the presentation, we'll talk about how we can correct some of these things. Um, and if, if anyone wants to interrupt me, you got questions, go ahead, feel free. Rob, if you got anything that you want to add or, or ask about, we can do that too. So if we look at the hip, um, I'm sure a lot of the, the trainers, strength coaches, um, even, you know, people themselves as they squat, you know, you kind of wonder why, man, why I'm trying to get this person to squat. They're, they're forward tilt with their trunk. Uh, one knee is caving in. Uh, we have both knees falling in, both knees too far out. Toe alignment is off. Um, you know, sometimes it's just very difficult. And this is a guy that Rob has been training for about 35 years and he still can't figure it oh, out. Boy. So there's a lot of issues going on, but, um, some of the things that we need to consider with squat mechanics is that everybody is different. Everybody's anatomy is different. So you can see here, these are three different positions, uh, where the femur kind of sits into the socket and is aligned in the socket. So that coxa vera, you're going to be a little bit more bow-legged. So your natural squat position, your knees are going to want to come out, okay? 
the coxivalga, it's going to be a little bit more of a higher angle, but you're going to be a little bit more knock need. So if we're trying to really hammer in on people, hey, knees out, knees out, knees out, but they're actually stressing their body to produce that external torque that could start to eat away at some of the tissues within the hip joint, um, the labrum, for example, or we can just be putting unnecessary stress, uh, malalignment of their joints. So um, just one thing to consider, this positioning of the, the femoral neck and how it's angled will affect the knee position with squatting. So um, I, I attended uh, one of John Russin's uh, pain performance certifications and yeah. he was showing um, one of his colleagues had like 12 cadaver uh, pictures of femoral heads. Right. And he goes, you know, try to try to find the ones that mix and match and that look similar, this and that. The 12 that they had came from like eight different people. Yeah. So they weren't matches. Yeah. Some of the people had um, a, a shorter neck length on their left hip right. and a longer one on the right. right. And so a lot of the issues came up to, it's like, you can't just do 15 degrees on each side and everybody's home free. Right. You could literally have one foot that's ideally at 30 on the right and 15 on the left. And right. that would be their ideal squat or deadlift right. position. So yeah. how, how would we find the ideal situation for each? Is this the happy baby on the ground test where we're trying to find where it naturally shifts or what? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's there's considerations here with how the, the neck is aligned. There's also considerations of torsion of the whole femoral shaft, which we'll get into on this next slide here. Um, so those two things can greatly affect where your knee is positioned, where your foot is positioned, and how that feels to you, right? I think probably the best way to go about this stuff is really, um, and I got some cadavers on here too, so you can see the differences there but really what the best thing to do is what is the most comfortable position for you? Uh, as long as everything else up the chain is stacking up, then we should be cool, right? But if somebody has that variation where their knees kind of collapse in a little bit um, and then their forward trunk tilting or they're leaning over, over to one side, nothing's really stacking up, well, then that's where our coaching comes into play. So that's where we have to change their foot alignment or change their knee alignment. Uh, it's pretty difficult to go uh, one by one. There are some tests that we can do. They're not super valid tests, but you can lie them in a prone position, rotate their hip, and then see how much retroversion or antiversion they have, which will give you a sense for, okay, their more natural position is knees in versus knees gotcha. out or even a, a neutral alignment. So it's really, really tough um, unless they're comfortable position is a dangerous position and they can't produce any power or force through there. Well, then that's where we can make some minor changes. But I think if we make these global sweeping changes, everybody turn your feet out 15, 30 degrees, everybody knees over your pinky toe, like that's, that's where we can get into a little bit of trouble and cause more stress and more damage than good. The hard part would be trying to figure out, is this a, a structural issue or is it a overdevelopment issue, right? right. Like you right. could have people that are so muscularly overdeveloped that it's giving the lead of like, oh, they've got this structural issue. Right. Really, it's not, it just need to be corrected, right? right. Yeah, they, yeah so exactly. So that, there's, a, there's a lot of coaching tips that we can do. For sure, yeah. Yeah, but we're, we're not going to change somebody's uh, bony alignment. We're not gonna yeah. change the, the mechanics of that joint. I mean, people are built the way that people are built. So we have to kind of work around that, you know, and just make it as safe as possible and get them as strong as possible as well so they can control those motions. So yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother, we can go down the, the down rabbit hole with those. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. So, um, we talked about some squat considerations with the, the anatomy of the hip. Um, here are some hinge considerations. So any RDLing deadlifts, um, you know, what we talked about with the anatomy, the glutes are inhibited a lot of the times. Um, this was a biomechanical study where they looked at trunk tilt in the RDL to see which was more active, the groin, the hamstrings, or the glutes. So you can see between this, the sweet spot is really the, the zero to 30 degree range for glute activation. That's why the top of that hip thrust or the top of that bridge, you can really get a strong contraction there. But if you do go too far down in a deadlift motion or an RDL motion, you're going to feel a lot more hamstring work. Your hamstrings are going to be sore. So as long as uh, we're programming this stuff for people, we just have to make sure that our, our ranges of motion are appropriate. And you can see the hamstring activates a little bit more between that 30 and 75 degree range. So if we're saying that the glutes become inhibited a lot, well, then maybe we need to, to program our range of motions appropriately for that. So uh, 
that's with the, the anatomy there and how that kind of influences some of our movement. But now we're going to talk about a little bit what happens when we age. And this is, this is Rob after I just whooped his butt in horseshoes about three weeks ago. Hey, he got pretty, hey. he got pretty upset about me. <laughs> so, uh, this is what happened you, but when we age, you can get a little more angry, right? You're a little mm -hmm. bit more irritable. When somebody beats you at something, you can be a little bit more upset than maybe you were 20, you 40 cheated. years ago. You cheated. Uh -huh. See, and that's what happens now. <laughs> they, they start to forget what actually happened as well. So um, he, he seems to still think he beat me like two out of three or whatever it is, but he didn't. So that's, that's his old age kind of showing up there. His wife actually carried him the whole way. <laughs> so Lisa is on here. Lisa, you kicked my butt. <laughs> I take the credit. I do have some pictures as evidence, but unfortunately they're on <laughs> Rob's phone. So I may never see those. Okay. Uh, but you know, you get a little angry, you get a little feisty, you know, whenever, whenever we age. Um, so these are some natural things that happen with aging, but other things happen as well. You know, we, here's a picture and some x-rays of some joints um, that you see, and you can see the joint on the right has some pretty good joint space there. Um, nothing really going on that and the, the joint on the left, you can see that medial side of the knee. It's more bone on bone right there. And this is what we see as we age. And um, there's some decreased joint space, mainly due to the cartilage thinning. And this is just kind of normal wear and tear, right? We can't really change, again, the, the anatomical structures that are occurring, but there are some things that we can do to make sure that the range of motion is appropriate for what they need to do throughout the day. There's also a decrease in flexibility due to water density. So our tissues just don't have an, as much water in them. So the tissues can't expand and shorten as much as they normally did. Our muscle mass tends to decline a little bit, which can obviously uh, decrease your overall function. If you're not as strong, it's gonna be hard to lift things up from the ground. It's gonna be hard to carry them. It's gonna be hard to lift overhead. So these are all things that kind of naturally happen as we age. Um, some of the biomechanical things that can happen and with the shoulder and the hip specifically, the shoulder, the lot, that loss of joint space can lead to flexion and internal rotation range of motion deficits. So um, that overhead ability, that reaching behind our body ability tends to uh, start to decrease the more we age. But again, there's some things that we can do to help out with that. With the hip, you lose flexion, internal rotation, extension when that cartilage starts to wear down. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but deep squatting, deadlifting from the ground and glute activation are kind of some key, key things there. So um, one thing that happens with aging, obviously we lose some range of motion because of things we just talked about and you're just more prone to have injuries. I mean, um, the longer we're on this earth, and we're active, there's gonna be some things that happen, right? So we're gonna go through some common injuries here. Um, and again, we have some little videos to kind of show what's going on with these different injuries. So this is subacromial bursitis. When we're looking at that space between the chromium, which is that white bone on the top and the humeral head, that's a subacromial space. And this is a bursa that's right on top there. So it's a lot of overuse, a lot of overhead work. Uh, maybe you worked in the garden a lot and maybe you were packaging boxes up in your attic and you're doing a lot of overhead activity, well, you can get some impingement of that bursa. It can become very inflamed um, due to that overuse and then you'll lose some range of motion because of that. And this is something that if treated immediately, um, doesn't have to be a bad thing, but you'll definitely lose some uh, over shoulder height movements and across body movements. Now, rotator cuff tears are a little bit different and um, you, know, you can have a, a small rotator cuff tear and can be completely fine. You can have a big rotator cuff tear and be completely fine. As you can see here, the, the humeral head is kind of rotating underneath that acromion and that space right there. Um, over time, and the more that we do, we can get really small kind of micro tears in that tendon, um, which we'll see right here. You see it kind of eats away. And the more we do, you know, maybe throughout the period of 20, 30 years, and then you go do something really quick and oh. it kind of tears smack just like that. So you can see that's, that's definitely a complete tear and Rob's kind of cringing and crying over here right now, but um, that's a that's a complete tear of the supraspinatus muscle. That smaller tear right there is a complete tear of only about half of the muscle. So there's many different grades of tears there. Um, you know, there you can have a small tear, a large tear, you can be completely fine. You can have a small tear and be completely floored too. Um, it's really all over the place. The, the second tear, do you call that a vertical tear? Um, there's what would you call that, like the angle, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, you just call it a tear. Because okay. <laughs> you can tear this way, right? You Horizontal can tear, so yeah. Okay, so I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so I'm asking, like, for the rehab, are those with the, the obviously different? One has to be fixed, the other can be rehabbed. Can rehab through, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that's the difference between a partial tear and a full tear. So that tear that goes all the way through the tendon, even though it's like 50% of the tendon, that's a complete tear of 50% of the tendon. 
So you can also have a tendon that, um, like Rob's saying, can go horizontally across the tendon. So maybe it's just shaving off that top 25% of the tendon, then that's a partial tear of 25% of the tendon. Typically you get between the 25 and 50% partial tears, and that's where you may have to consider surgery. But I would say the majority of people walking around, the majority of active people who use their arms and use their shoulders a lot have some degree of tearing in the rotator cuff, whether it's uh, these older degenerative tears um, that don't go all the way through and they're walking around completely fine. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have surgery or you can't be functional. We do just have to look at the compromised movements, reaching out to the side and lifting, vertical pressing, horizontal pressing. There may be some limitations with that. And again, we'll talk about that um, a little bit further. I might be jumping on this here, but repairs for that. What are they using nowadays for repairs? Are they still pulling a piece of hamstring? Like where are they? Are they cadaver pieces? Like yeah. Yeah. They so options? they try to save as much tissue as possible. So they'll take some thread and kind of, uh, weave it between the tissues and try to bring it together. And then mm -hmm. they'll tack that down to the bone. Um, so that's probably the most common. And that's why you see it's more of a rotator cuff repair versus a rotator cuff reconstruction. So, uh, if they have, if the tear is so big to where they can't repair it, that's where you get into situations where, okay, this is an unrepairable tendon. Now we have to think about more of a total joint replacement or a reverse total shoulder, which um, at that point, you don't save the rotator cuff muscles at all. Um, all it is is changing those joint surfaces so you don't have the pain and the grinding of the lack of cartilage gotcha. in there. Yeah. And, uh, what about the, I know I've seen some of these and I don't know how, how much experience there is with you with this, but with like the stem cell repair pieces that they literally will put in there and it's like six to eight weeks or whatnot where you just can't move, right? Like it almost has to adhere into that position before you can start to generate, you know, range of motion and all that. Right. Is that, that's still relatively new. Uh, yeah. Rehab, that's, right. And repairs. That's some, um, uh, that's newer orthobiologics that they're coming out with. So stem cell injections, uh, PRP injections are becoming more common too. With PRP, there's two types of injections. There's one that re, um, reinitiates the healing process. So that's where you can be like really sore after the injection. That's where you're going to be in a sling. And it's almost like you had surgery because mm -hmm. they are trying to repair the tendon. The other PRP injection is more of a um, anti-inflammatory. So it can be used in an adjunct to a cortisone injection. So that's where you're just trying to decrease the irritation around the area. It's not really going to heal anything, but it's going to eliminate the inflammation from settling. The stem cell stuff is um, becoming used more and more. Um, it's still, there's still not a lot of good research out on it. So insurance companies really aren't reimbursing for it. Um, but stem cell injections typically work fairly well with tendon injuries, muscle injuries. Um, we don't see it work as well with cartilage or labral type of issues. So um, yeah, but they shoot the stem cell, the stem cells in that area. And their hope is that the stem cells bring all the healing properties to that area so that that tendon can, um, regenerate and become stronger again. But yeah, the, the jury is still out on all those studies. The cartilage in the labrum is just too too dense of a material to have a, yeah. positive, a positive impact on it. Our, our body can't regenerate that as well as it can lay, lie down scar tissue that can repair a, a tendon. Now they're doing stuff overseas and we have the FDA here that has to approve everything. So, um, you know, there's potential for outside of the country stem cell injections where they're doing some different stuff that we can't really do here. Um, and they are seeing some regeneration, um, some of those tissues, gotcha. but it's still not the same, right? Um, no, those, are, those are good things here. So when we look at the labrum, there's labrum in the shoulder, there's labrum in the hip. Um, when the labrum tears, um, this can be pretty painful as well. So Rob's cringing again. So you take the humeral head away here. Um, I think we got a little little delay, but what's going to happen is that humeral head is going to move out of the way and then it's going to show us the, the glenoid here that has that little cartilage rim around. That's the bicep tendon that comes in. Let's play that again. My internet connection is unstable yeah, is what it's telling me here. But um, you guys can see on the, on the picture on the left that the labrum is kind of peeled back off of the bone. So that's a, a labral tear. And this can happen when you fall on an outstretched arm. Oh, there we go. We're back. We're back. Okay, so we're going to remove the humeral head here, remove the bicep tendon, that little flip up there at the top of the labrum, that's a bicep that actually attaches onto the labrum, but you can see the, the labral tear right there. Now, what's pretty significant about that is the labrum's whole uh, being 
is to provide suction like that plunger that you can see over on the right hand side. So everyone's used a plunger before. Um, I had to use it when Rob came over my house about two weeks ago, but we won't talk about that. Uh, but you know that when that's, you plunge down, hey, be quiet. This is my time. Be news. quiet. That's so he's trying, when you're trying to plunge out, like I was doing, Rob came over, uh, there's a lot of suction in that plunger, right? But imagine if that plunger had a big slit through it. What would you do with that plunger? You toss it. It's, it's worthless, right? It's not working anymore. And that's exactly what happens with the labrum, the shoulder, and the hip. You lose that suction effect. So now those static stabilizers aren't necessarily working as well. You need a lot more from your dynamic stabilizers, such as the rotator cuff. It becomes more important how that scapula sits on the, the short, on the rib cage, all that that we're going to talk about. Okay. Alexander says they call me the plumber. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. No, I'm getting it from my blowing up, too. blowing up. Everybody's playing on me. <laughs> So com compromise movements, uh, you can have a labral tear in the top, you can have it in the back. Uh, this labral tear right here on the left-hand side is called a slap tear, so it's superior to um, superior labral anterior posterior tear right there. Um, so just a fancy way of saying labral tear. But you can have them in the, in the back side and the front side with dislocations and whatnot. So this is, uh, this is something too I've experienced with my hips. Those of you guys, if, if it's uh, new, new to you or new news, I've had both my hips replaced. And not having that labrum basically creates like a, we, we kind of nicknamed it like slippage, like this feeling where you don't have that suction. It can literally, the head can just kind of slip out. It's very uncomfortable when it happens, but it's, it more affects like your, your confidence that this joint is not going to come apart. So I could be laying on the bed and my kids are trying to climb up and they'll grab my leg and pull and I'll feel that occur. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't take much for that. We, we kind of take for granted how much support the labrum, you know, holds these joints together and, and creates structure for us. So that's, that's a big, that's a big concern there when you're looking at these injuries, uh, trying to get them strong and healthy again. Yeah. And you just lose your, your static stability of the joint, you know, so, uh, the labrum along with the joint capsule and the ligaments that surround the joint, which we not going to dive into today, but all that is static stabilization of the joint. So it allows your rotator cuff, it allows the glutes and the rotators of the hip to really stabilize the joint. And there's some smooth movement there. You don't feel like it slips or has that subluxation feeling so that your, your big power producers, you know, your quads, your hamstrings, your pecs, your deltoids, um, your rhomboids, they can actually move weight, right? So if you're losing that static stability, the joint is going to be unstable. You're going to be weaker. It's, it's, it's just going to happen and there's no getting around it. Um, if again, if there's a small tear, you can rehab through that. You can still do everything um, that you need to do. A, a really good study 10 plus years ago of major league pitchers and they took a hundred pitchers. Um, none of them had pain in their shoulder. And these guys are, they're going through a really aggressive, forceful movement of throwing a baseball at 90 miles per hour. Um, they took an MRI of all hundred, none of them had pain and 88 to 90% of them had labral tears. How significant were they? Um, you know, some were significant, others were not significant, but 0% of them had pain. And they're doing something very aggressive with their shoulder. So mm -hmm. just because you have some of these things doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're gonna be non-functional. You're talking about like the structural support and how the strength has to work from that security of the labrum. You see someone like Dave Tate, powerlifter Dave Tate, who's still doing box box squats with 800 pounds and right. all this with two fake hips. Right. You know what I mean? Like it, right. it brings into question, like how secure is this really happening? You're abusing the shit out of it. Number one, rolling the dice, I feel like, but yeah. you know, is he, is he at a strength level or an ability level to repeat what he was doing before? This isn't as good, right? It's, this is a, this is an improved quality of life repair. This isn't a performance improvement by any means. Like there's no advantage to this, correct? Right. So when, when you start talking about replacing joints, you're at your end. So you've gone through probably a couple surgeries before that, whether it's a labral um, arthroscopy, or arthroscopy, you're doing a, a labral um, fixation, you're doing a rotator cuff fixation, you're doing a capsule, um, a capsular tightening is something they do too when there's laxity. So you've gone through this and it's failed, you know, whether it's failed in a year, 10 years, 20 years, um, now you're getting to the point where you have unremitting pain. There's pain constantly all the time. Um, you can't rehab through it. You can't strengthen through it. You can't stretch through it. That's where you have some of these total joint replacements because you're in constant pain. So the big thing that joint replacement does is it eliminates that pain. 
Now your joints are going to move a little bit differently for sure. Um, there's not going to be as much of those dynamic stabilizers because in the shoulder, for example, um, a lot of the times you have a replacement, you only have a subscap muscle. So all the other three, all the other three of the other four rotator cuff muscles are gone. So um, they just, they just disconnect. they're just gone. Yeah, they're cool. gone. So that joint is going to give you that static stability. And that's why you're a lot weaker after those procedures. Um, but yeah, there's, there is no performance um, yeah. enhancement after a joint replacement, at least not that I've seen. That <laughs> so, okay. And then uh, we get into uh, shoulder OA osteoarthritis. So this is something that can happen, you know, as we age, again, there's wear and tear, you can have some repetitive trauma, you can have um, different procedures done in there where they kind of shave down and smooth the surfaces. But you can see this is what a normal shoulder should look like as it's rolling and gliding in there. Um, and those are that white stuff is the cartilage in which we have thick cartilage. Now, that little defect right there. And as the cartilage starts to wear away, you can see the joint space decreases. So you can impinge a lot more. You can have some of these rotator cuff um, tears a little bit more. Now you see that bone on bone um, kind of movement happening there. That's where you get the grinding, the clicking, the um, bone spurs start to develop because bone is hitting bone. So that's gonna grow more bone. And all, all that can cause further issues such as the rotator cuff tear. Um, but that's where it becomes really bad. Um, that's where you, know, you lose a lot of mobility. And again, some of the things that we talked about previously and what we're gonna talk about um, a little bit later on, that's how we're gonna try to maintain or even make um, small gains in our range of motion to make sure we're functional. So the, the jagged rough bone is that's what not normal. starts to wear on the rotator cuff. It can, yeah. yeah, it can. As you elevate the arm, those bone spurs can start to chip away at the rotator cuff. And it usually happens on that, that top bone there, the chromium. Mm -hmm. So when you hit the head of the humerus on the chromium because you lose joint space or you're impinging a lot, there can be some bone growth on the chromium. That can kind of eat away at the supraspinatus tendon that comes over the top of the joint. With the joint space shortening. With the joint space shortening. Greater. And we're still doing overhead lifting and we're still pressing and doing all that stuff. So it can potentially eat away gotcha. at that. So that's why it's important to uh, know about the compromised movements and know how to train these people. Um, so common hip injuries, we'll go through these pretty quickly. There is impingement inside of the hip, like there is impingement inside of the shoulder. Um, again, there's a deeper cup to the hip joint itself. Um, it has to be much more stable because it's a weight bearing joint, right? So um, the same type of impingement can occur if you're doing a lot of excessive flexion or internal rotation, adduction moments, you can have a little bone growth right there that we just talked mm -hmm. about with the shoulder. That, that was me exactly. That bone growth right there on the, on the acetabulum is called a pincer lesion. And that's where just, it's a fancy word for bone growth. And you can see as you do more flexion movements or rotation movements, you can start to eat away at that labrum, which is that white piece right across the top of the acetabulum. That's a labral tear right there. So that's where the bone spurs can start to eat away at your cartilage, start to eat away at your labrum. If you're going into these deep squatting positions when you don't have adequate mobility to do so. Um, so that's where, that's where the hip impingement can come into play. There can also be on the neck of the femur, you can have some growth there, which is a cam lesion. So either one, you can have both um, as well. So they go in there, they try to shave those bone spurs down, they try to repair the labrum um, and then get you back to the activities you were doing previously. Um, labrum tear, we can go through this pretty quickly. It's pretty similar to the shoulder as well. We saw a little kind of overuse injury with impingement um, causing a labral tear. You can also have uh, more of a subluxation of the hip, which can pull on that labrum and cause the tear similar to the shoulder. Um, so you can see normal motion in there. You can see if there's a lot of contact and the joint space starts to shrink, you can have some of these repetitive injuries. It's not super common to have them um, in the back side of the joint, more of the, the front and lower portion of the joint as you go into hyper abduction or leg out to the side positions is where you can get some of these labral tears um, in athletics. So hip OA, um, pretty similar to the, the shoulder OA. Um, we're going to jam through that. We don't really need to see that anymore. Rob's over here cringing and you know, rubbing his shoulder, rubbing his hips right now. But the main thing to, to think about with injuries, like we said, you can, have, you can have tears, you can have labral tears, rotator cuff tears, you can have arthritis. Um, that itself is not going to limit you, but what is going to limit you is pain. Whenever you have injury, there is a, a pain slash motor inhibition component to that. So what happens is 
um, let's say you injure your knee, for example, you sprain your knee, it may not be very bad, but you have pain in there. You walk around with pain, that pain is gonna inhibit your quad muscle from functioning correctly. So what that does is you start to have some atrophy of your quad. And then you rest for a couple of weeks, you have some atrophy of your quad, you go out and you try to run. Well, now your quad is super weak, but you're having a little bit more joint pain now when you're running, squatting, lunging. And it's not because you're injured, but it's because the quad isn't functioning how it was before your injury. So um, that's why when pain is on board, it's really difficult to do anything else. And this is more of a neuromuscular issue um, than a actual structural issue. So first thing we have to do is get pain out of there. And when you have pain in the hip, you have pain in the shoulder, it doesn't matter what type of injury you have, the glutes become inhibited. And in the shoulder, the lower trap and the infraspinatus, which is a big external rotator become inhibited. So that's why we kind of target these muscles with our corrective exercises and try to get them firing a little bit before we do our lunges, squats, deadlifts, overhead pressing, horizontal pressing, that type of stuff. Gluteal amnesia is real. Gluteal amnesia is real. Mm -hmm. We've seen it, it's out there. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we try to address. So when we look at the methodology of doing some of these corrective exercises, this is a great approach to take. It's a joint by joint approach. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's where the body is stacked with um, different levels of stability and mobility. So when we look at this, the neck typically is a very uh, mobile joint. So it needs stability. The thoracic spine needs mobility. The lumbar spine needs stability. The hip needs mobility, but it also needs to be stable too. So that's where it starts to get a little tricky in the hip joint. We definitely need it to be mobile or else the lower back's going to take over, but we definitely need it to be stable or else the knee is going to have some difficulty as well. The knee needs um, some stability and the ankle needs some mobility. So if you take this general approach to looking at uh, each joint and kind of where you should go as far as strength and exercises, activation exercises, or flexibility exercises, this is a good starting point. Um, so as we get into corrective exercises, really what we're trying to do um, with our clients, with our patients is maximize mobility. And how do we do this? We do it through range of motion exercises. We do it through stabilization exercises, and then we train the movement pattern. If we train the movement pattern without having range of motion of the hip, you're going to have some issues. If you train stabilization before you have range of motion of the shoulder, you're going to have some issues. So it's really important to follow this step-by-step -step guide. Yes, they're all important for maximizing mobility, but you definitely have to address range of motion first then you can get a stable joint and then you can actually move some weight. If we skip these steps, we're gonna run into some trouble. So in the shoulder, what can we do? We talked about the anatomy. We talked about how that can affect the shoulder joint. Uh, we need to strengthen the muscles around the scapula, strengthen the muscles of the rotator cuff, increase flexibility of the thoracic spine. And maybe more importantly is understand some of the compromising movements. So when we look at scapular strength, this is something that we um, you know, looked at a little bit earlier. You want to raise that arm up, see if you can get that inferior angle to that mid axillary line. Um, if the lower trap isn't functioning correctly, which we know that it doesn't when there's shoulder pain, then we need to get functioning before we can do any type of overhead lifting. Um, this may be a simple exercise and it may look really simple, but this is extremely difficult. So this is this exercise here activates the lower trap specifically um, when re with regards to the other muscles around the ro uh, ro rotator cuff and the scapula. Um, this is a prone lift at about 110 degrees of abduction range of motion. And you're really trying to get that scapula to rotate and spin around the, the rib cage there. So we can use this exercise as a warm up. Uh, if we're going to do overhead lifting, we can get the scapula working. We can do that lower trap muscle as long uh, as well as some of these other movements that we're going to talk about. Rotator cuff strength. This is a, a, an exercise that again, gets overlooked a lot, but when we're looking at the infraspinatus and we know that that becomes atrophied with any type of shoulder pain, we need to get it firing first before we do any aggressive um, pushing, pulling type of exercises. And to do this correctly, you should really feel a burn in that posterior lateral portion of the shoulder. So you can see here as he goes through, and sorry with this quality here, I have an iPhone like two. So my, my, <laughs> my video quality is pretty poor. You dial up internet wasn't, <laughs> dial up internet wasn't working that day. Uh, but you can see he's got a little towel roll underneath his elbow. Uh, kind of hard to see, but you have to set your scapula. So you have to do a little scapular retraction and depression before you lift. If not, you're going to get a lot of scapular movement. Then you're going to be training your rhomboids. You're going to be training your traps. We really want to be specific to that infraspinatus. And as you guys can see in that diagram on the left, the rotator cuff, really all those muscles work to pull the ball into the socket so that we don't have any uh, excessive movement, which will allow the pec and the, the rhomboids and the deltoids to really do what they, they should be doing, which is producing force. 
rotator cuff strengthening exercises um, can be open chain. They need to be closed chain as well. So this is a little progression here, closed chain, where he did some protractions there. Now you can lift one arm off the ground and you're really looking at your scapula to make sure it's not winging or popping off your shoulder blade. So he's got a three point stance with one arm and two feet down. And then you can add some bear crawls there too. So once you show that you can actually activate your scapular stabilizers, you can keep your scapula against your rib cage. Then you can get to a three point stance and really load that arm a little bit more. If we can see that the form with that is great, then we can move to a little bit more dynamic movements, which is the bear crawling. The, the neuromuscular patterning of learning the push-up scapular retraction position. You have trouble teaching people that. That seems to be like a pretty tricky one. People bend their elbows, they move their head oh, up yeah. and down. Like learning that. Any any other tricks? Teaching them on the yeah. wall first, like something like that, to kind of get that action trained before you start to progress it. Yeah, for sure. That's a, it's a very difficult movement to do correctly. Cause you're right. Everyone tries to do a push up. Whenever you put someone's hands on the ground and you ask them to do something with their body, it's always a push up yeah. or their next moving all yeah. over the place. So you can have them lie on their back and this gives them a little feedback too, cause they can feel their scapula against the ground and you can just do scapular punches up towards the ceiling. So they're nice. lying in that supine position on their back, like punch that. straight up towards the sky, come back and that way they can really feel their scapula kind of move on the ground and away from their midline and then it comes back. So that's really a good cue to use um, for them. I'll stand in front of them too, or on top of them and say, hey, you need to move and punch my hand. So they can really get that big reach and you're trying to get the scapula to move around the rib cage and have that serratus anterior kind of keep it in place. Um, so that's what I'll do a lot of the times at a, as a, at a lower level. Um, exercise progression. I'll do uh, similar, but put a, a mini band around their elbows. It's probably the only time I actually put a band at the joint yeah. because I don't want them to move it. Right? right. So if they bend it, they'll feel they're putting tension on the yeah. band, just lock it there. And now yeah. the only movement you can do is from that scapula there. No, that's perfect. But you're right. Everybody tries to bend the elbow yeah. constantly with this. So in order to do it correctly, yeah, there's, there's a lot of cueing that needs to be involved. And if they're in that closed chain position and their scapula is just winging and popping up, you don't progress to the next next exercise. You wait until they can get strong enough and keep that thing stable. Otherwise, if they go through your pushing motion, you start to do some pressing, well, that scapula is going to pop off. It's going to change the orientation of the socket. And then you're going to have some of these issues as far as impingement um, or a, a change in the length tension relationship with some of the muscles we're trying to work. They're just going to start to compensate somewhere else. For sure. Definitely. Yep. So thoracic spine mobility is huge. We talked about that with slump sitting and standing up tall. Um, if you slump sit, you're not going to be able to raise your arm up. If you slump sit, you're not going to be able to bring your elbow back into that horizontal abduction position behind your body. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good um, exercise. It, it actually works flexibility and stability of one side. So as he rotates up to the right, this is a quadruped uh, T-spine rotation. Uh, he rotates to the right. He's actually getting some closing down on that right side. So extension on the right side, and he's getting uh, flexion on the left side of his thoracic spine. So um, this is really good. You definitely want to do this bilaterally. Um, you do it bilaterally and that increases the overall extension of the thoracic spine. So that's one. This is another one that I love a lot is a wall slide. Um, and you can see here, well, I'm going to go around to the side view, but you can see he's cheating a little bit. So we really want that sacrum um, and that butt to be all the way up against the wall. You see some space there. I don't like that. Now you look at his arms too, and you see his wrist as he slides down, his wrist comes off the wall. Mm -hmm. I don't like that either. So um, really in order for this to be an effective exercise, you have to have that hip all the way up against the wall. Um, that tightens up your adductors. It keeps you in a little posterior tilt um, so that when you go up, your lats don't bring you into that anterior tilt position. Um, so it really requires a lot of thoracic extension to slide the arms up and down the wall and keep your wrist against the wall. People try to pop their wrist up all the time and you only go up as high as you can. You don't keep gotcha. grinding through if these pop so out. If, if you elevated him, let's say you put him on a yoga block, put him up four inches, you take tension off the hamstring, off the glute, off the lower erectors. Is that going to improve his range overhead because you're like decreasing the that will definitely improve his his range overhead, but you do want to continue to challenge somebody, right? So if they're yeah. if they're just doing it, no problem. They're mm -hmm. over there whistling and talking to their buddy, and it's going up and down. They're not really getting anything out of it. Then you start to lower that block a little bit. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. So that's the question: is like, where where do you look at it and say like you're not doing it just right, but we want to pursue it, or do you put them in a position where they can do it right? 
you yeah, I mean, show them that they can't do it right and you okay. show them how that feels when they're not doing it right and then you put them in a position to be successful so that they can see okay this is oh yeah that didn't feel good um, i felt it in other places now i put a yoga block underneath me i got a little pad or whatever now i'm doing it. okay boom yeah now i'm not compensating anywhere else i can now. really feel okay. it okay so yeah. it's almost uh sometimes it's it's important to show them uh, where not to fill it or have them do it a couple times and ask them, get their feedback. And if they're not filling in the appropriate position, okay, so we're going to make these little changes. Okay. Now you're filling your thoracic spine. You're filling in your shoulders. Perfect. That's exactly where you should fill it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So with the shoulder compromising movements, um, this is something that has been a pet peeve of mine. I've injured myself multiple times doing some upright rows. Uh, upright rows are great for upper trap development, um, deltoid development, it's absolutely terrible for the shoulder. You can see the guy on the left, he is doing an upright row. Mm -hmm. um, I got my guy over here on the right. This is a, a impingement test. So when we talked about that subacromial impingement of that bursa, this is a test that we do to see if that bursa is inflamed. Mm -hmm. um, so you can take a look and when I get to the end, I'm pointing at that position of his forearm. That's the exact same position you're in with a, an upright row. So um, that's the number one reason why we shouldn't do this exercise. It's very, very damaging to the shoulder, especially over time. We can get upper trap development and deltoid development in different ways. So take a second on this. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld and, and company had a, an article research that they did on this that showed a new angle attack for the upright row to not exceed parallel at the shoulder height yeah. and to produce a pull apart abduction component. So they're actually queuing to come up to shoulder height and separate. So they're doing like cross cable upright rows so they can have, you know, an angle of attack with the pulleys rather than a fixed bar, yeah. you know, or a kettlebell or something like that. Right. Does that angle of attack make sense in, in an ability to still like, what are we pursuing with the upright? Are we pursuing a delt? Are we pursuing brachioradialis, like forearm? What's, you know, what's the benefit that we're pursuing it? And is, is it worth trying to perfect that movement or just do something else? That's with everything that we do, right? We're trying to determine risk versus reward benefit. And um, this just puts the shoulder. And I, I think doing a cable row because the angle of pull is different mm -hmm. is gonna be probably put the shoulder in a little bit different position. It may not impinge as much, but a lot of people don't have the internal rotation to even do this movement yeah. to begin with, yeah. you know? So then we're kind of grinding through and you're not gonna, I mean, you can be there to watch them on a few reps, but you, it's going to be very difficult to make sure they're doing this completely right. And they're not every compensating time. every single time. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's my thing. Uh, if it's something that's going to put the shoulder at risk for injury, we can get muscle development a different way. I'm all for that. Olympic lifting, they use it, um, in the USAW cert. I mean, they, they're pulling up and they're doing that, which, you know, uh, that's not really a lift. It's a, a, a assistant movement, but, you really should drive through your through your legs, through the ground. That bar pull should be kind of really low. And then when it's floating up toward your chin, you're not really pulling it, it's floating, right? So then you can get underneath it. But I just think there's better ways of strengthening those muscles without being into this, this uh, impingement zone that we actually test for when there is shoulder pathology. I really, I really like the upright and I like the high pull for the like the Superman proud pull position yeah. at the top. Yeah. So we'll put our anchors, you know me, I like to rig stuff. So sure. we'll, we'll put our anchors at a 45 degree angle from where our clients yeah. are pulling. We'll cross, we don't do pulleys, so we'll cross band. And then as they come into their hinge and they come up to the high pull, I'll have them pulled to shoulder height, scapula yeah. height, and then rotate. Right. So we call it the Superman, like you're pulling the shirt apart, that same action, you know, but we're externally rotating in the high pull which yeah. seems to be pretty comfortable for people. And like that's they, key is that external rotation. Cause if you just pull up in the picture that we see right here, that's maximal shoulder internal rotation, that's impingement. But if you just rotate externally, that actually changes how the humeral head is in the socket. So you do kind of clear the chromium at that point. Mm -hmm. And again, pulling vertically versus pulling horizontally at more of a diagonal, it is gonna change the, the biomechanics of the shoulder. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. We, have an, we have enough clients, sorry to keep interrupting you, but okay, we okay. have enough clients that we can't you know, we can't do overhead action with them yeah. yet. So I'm trying to progress to that point where we can, right. the higher the pole, you know, the higher development, we're going to eventually get that hood to come back. So I can free up overhead. Right. Right. So this is kind of one of those tweener exercises where we're not quite there yet, sure. but there's, there's the benefit, like the why to this right. is we're inching towards that. And that's as long as you have a why and there's a step-by-step -step progress. I mean, that's, that's what we're going for there. So, 
Perfect. Okay. So another compromising movement. Um, you guys can see this is Arnold here back in the, I don't know, wins, uh, 80s, maybe 70s, who knows. Uh, but if you look in what we talked about is that labral tear where that bicep attaches, anytime the arm goes way back in the horizontal abduction like that, again, it's great for deltoid activity, great for pec activity, not too good on our joints. And it can do this little peel back mechanism of the labrum uh, with the bicep pulling on the labrum there. Dips too, it's just a really tough position to be in. Whenever you're going to end range of motion and then you're asking your body to produce force through that, it's always gonna to be tough on your joints. So uh, being a little bit more in mid range or not going to your uh, end limit into extension like she's going to, um, then you'll be able to work the triceps a little bit more effectively and you'll have some better joint health in the long term as well. The, the parallel dip bar is definitely a better option than behind the back here on the behind bench, the, right? I mean, you're putting like six or eight inches of pre-stretch on that that's not really needed. Right, yeah, so. exactly. So the parallel bars are better. Um, you can if change the angle dip. of your trunk yeah. that way. This way you can't change the angle of your trunk, which um, obviously changes the range of motion in the shoulder as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the shoulder. And then hip health, what can we do for the hip? You know, we have to strengthen the stabilizing muscles of the hip. Uh, we have to increase the mobility of the hip and increase flexibility of the ankle. And the ankle is very important for the hip as well. Um, and anybody who has tried to teach a proper squat form knows that if you can't anteriorly translate that knee over your toes because of ankle tightness, you're going to have a lot more trunk tilt, and that's going to lead to impingement inside of the hip. So not something that we look at a lot of the times, but definitely something that needs to be screened. So hip stabilizers, this is a great exercise here. Uh, even on your knees in a plank position, doing this clam motion. So you're getting hip abductors on the bottom and you're getting external rotators on the top. Um, I'm a huge fan, as I know Rob is, is using bands as some resistance. Um, so, and it gives that person that cue, right? So even with our squats, if we put the band around the knees, you're really cueing them to push out into the band. They can have their knees in, they can have their knees out, but you're creating that torque in the glutes, which is what we're going for. You, uh, during quarantine, you were doing like weekly workouts that you were doing on Instagram that you were posting. Yeah. Dude, some of the primers you did, like your warm up primers that you did, yeah. were fantastic. <laughs> and it definitely inspired some new ideas and stuff to put yeah. in there, but you shared some good stuff. Is, is any of that still available or were those all, were those like day of posts where they were following your storyline or did you keep some of those where you can, you can uh, archive those a little bit for people to see them? Yeah, for sure. So all the, all those lifts were for the Sacramento Running Association. I, I do their strength and conditioning. We do it one day a week, and then they follow up one day a week on their own. Uh, but during quarantine, obviously, they weren't able to come in. So I still had to give them something. Um, and you know, if you tell if you give somebody a list of exercises, one, uh, maybe they know the names of it. Maybe they don't. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people like to come in and just do their thing and you know, you yell at them a little bit and tell them what to do, but they don't necessarily um, you know, understand the names of it and all that stuff. So the videos were very important for me to continue to do with them, to keep them engaged and keep them healthy. Uh, long story short. Yeah. All those workouts are on my Instagram page. Nice. Um, and I have my, my handle linked, um, a little bit later in the presentation. So people can view those if they, if they'd like how to, we, how are we doing on time for you then? We're, what do we we're got? five, we're five after right now. It's one Oh five. You got, Perfect. you got 10. I got 10. Minutes, okay. So let's do it. Okay. So we'll, we'll jam through these. I'll quit, um, I'll quit talking. <laughs> Rob's missing my time. I had an hour perfectly. He keeps like messing with me. Now we're good. Um, so for hip stabilizers, what's really important too is your abdominal control. If your abdominal cavity is loose or you're not really engaged, it's going to affect that tilt of the pelvis like we talked about, and that can affect the ability of your glutes to fire. So this uh, picture on the left, I love doing bridging with these pull downs. You pull down to really engage your abdominal core and then the hips drive up towards the ceiling. If you haven't tried this, try it. It changes the entire complexity of the bridge. Um, a lot of times when people feel the bridge in their lower spine, you pull down, activate the abs, the lower back extensors can't take over and you can really get that hip extension through your glutes, um, which is what we're looking for anyway. Uh, this, this video over on the right, I know Rob does this all the time. I love this so much. And again, this just trains that hip extension. You're pulling them into hip flexion. I think she's gonna stop there. Mm -hmm. That band's pulling her into hip flexion. So she has to fight against that, squeeze her glutes and her abs to get her into that hip extension position um, with an RDL or a deadlift motion. Your, your touchy lower back clients too, that it, it pre, you know, pushes them into or pulls them into like a tiny bit of attraction sure. position too. So we got a lot of clients we'll do without the weight you know, yeah. they'll just hold that or they'll self anchor another band in front of them oh, yeah. that'll progressively load as they come up, but it creates that little traction, that little relief with each lift right. and like bring some security, increased range of motion. So they're comfortable, right. but an accommodating resistance to improve on the way up. 
Like that was one of the best things I learned from you early yeah. on yeah. was, was that. Lift. And, and one of the, one of the things that's difficult to do when you're in pain is you don't know how to activate these muscles. We already talked about that. There's a lot of inhibition. So giving them uh, some cueing, some external cueing, push your hips into the band really likes those glutes up. So that's why I love this band stuff. Um, it's something that I didn't use a lot when I first started, but, no, I didn't um, and just randomly like through trial and error, trying a whole bunch of different things like, okay, boom, this makes sense with reciprocal inhibition. It makes sense to activate the abs, to take pressure off the back. Then you can really get your glutes going. Um, so we do it a lot. We do it with the shoulder. We do it with the hip. We do it with a, a bunch of stuff here. So hip mobility is extremely important. Like we talked about uh, a lot of things, a lot of the ranges of motion that get limited are extension, internal rotation, flexion. Um, this video on the left here, you get a little traction. So you're pulling that ball kind of down into the socket. So you're oh, decreasing nice. that impingement and then you're pulling that knee up to the chest. Oh, so I love that. I this, seen that. this should decrease the impingement feeling in the front of the hip. Um, usually we put it around a pole just for ease of video. I showed you tacking it to your, your foot, but if you put it around a pole, you can really generate a lot more torque. So it does give you like a little joint mobilization while you're stretching. You don't get that pinch. You get it more in the, the hamstrings. This is a no, no for hip replacement clients. This you don't want to do don't if you have hip replacement. Yeah. yeah. But I can see yeah. how comfortable that would be. For Very comfortable. If you're having, recovery. if you're having a labral tear and you're having yeah. impingement, it really helps. Um, Hip flexor stretching is extremely important. Like we talked about, it really limits the ability of that knee to translate posterior and get that good hip extension, which is so important for glute activation um, with back pain patients and hip pain patients specifically. To do this correctly though, you get down in the kneeling position, you have to do a little posterior tilt. So you tighten your abs, tighten your glutes, then you move forward just a little bit. You should feel it right in the front of the hip, not down the quad. Um, if you're moving forward, um, feet at a time, then you're probably doing it wrong. So make sure you're doing those two little cues and that should help you get a better stretch. Ankle mobility, extremely important. This is a test that you can do over on the left-hand side picture. So you wanna have about two and a half to four inches of movement of your knee over your toes. Take your shoes off, she has her shoes on, take them off to do this test because a heel lift in a shoe can definitely affect that. So you're measuring that distance between your toe and that pole in front of you or the wall in front of you, whatever you want to use. Um, but when we're doing this, a lot of the times we can get some impingement right in there in the front of the joint, right? And that's a little bone spur that's happening because of yes. a lot of continued dorsiflexion range of motion. So if you are limited with this, what happens um, is you do have a, a poor squat mechanic with that forward trunk tilt with the guy that we see over here on the right but he's not unable to get his knee over his toe because his ankle is so tight. So what happens that trunk tilts forward and you can see that angle of the trunk is a lot greater than the angle of the trunk on the guy on the left. Um, so you can get a lot more hip impingement uh, gotcha. symptoms. Gotcha. Um, ankle mobility. This is the, by far the number one ankle mobility exercise you can do. Um, you put the band right underneath the crease in your ankle, make sure it's below the malleoli, which is those balls on each side of your ankle. This is gonna be a little bit more of a rhythmic rocking movement because you wanna mobilize the joint. In the front view, you wanna drive your knee over the, the pinky toe. If you drive it over your big toe, you can kind of lose some of the stretch to your uh, plantar fascia there. Um, another compromising movement that we need to be aware of in the hip um, is how much, how much hip flexion do you actually have? So you can see the gal on the left, she's got pretty decent hip range of motion into that flexion position. If you don't have decent hip flexion range of motion, let's say you only have 90 degrees, you look at the guy on the right, he can't even get in the proper position to lift that bar off of the ground. So his back's gonna be compromised or he's gonna pinch inside of his hip. So um, you really have to do a, a test like we're doing over on the left-hand side to make sure you have enough hip range of motion in order to do movements like this. And that's uh, terrible. Ter terrible, 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 terrible lift terrible. right there. But again, if your hip, if your hip range of motion is poor, then that's what it's going to look yeah. like. Uh, the butt wink, this is something that happens a ton of the time. And we see with people who have tight hips and tight ankles, you get that little wink towards the bottom portion of your squat. And that's where you put the lower back at risk. Uh, you know, I still have people debate that that's okay. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't agree that it's okay at all. I mean, you, you're, if your hip and your pelvis tilt posteriorly, you're going to open up the backside of your disc. And when you have load on your back with that pressure, it's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. And, um, you know, you can get strong above that. You don't need to go that low is just my, my personal opinion. Right. So tip review, be aware of the thoracic spine for the shoulder, be aware of the ankle for the hip squat pattern. Um, anatom 
the anatomy influences our movement. So just be aware that you may have to change your knee position, foot position to see what is the most comfortable. As we age, range of motion injuries are unavoidable. So we do have to work around them and understand the compromising movements are really important. Um, program in some stretching and stabilizing exercises and look at the joint by joint approach. It'll kind of be a little bit of a guide um, for your go-to exercises for your clients or yourself. This is a, a ebook that I did about five or six years ago now. If you guys want more information on the squat pattern, you can definitely uh, check this out. It's available on Amazon. Um, and that's about all I got. These are my two little guys here. They're getting nice and strong as they grow. I got a five and a three-year-old and it's crazy every day. We're going to dog tomorrow. So my life oh, is going to nice. be terrible. Terrible. No, it's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be even better. Yeah, That's great, you, brother. Sir. Great job. And I, I just want to share, uh, this is our final registration number. Woo setting a new record. That's awesome. 220 That's awesome. attendees for Dan, the man. Thank you guys. The ball and socket joint. So thank yeah, you, everybody. Thank you we really appreciate you all being here with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Dan. Thank you for your time. Uh, guy ran up here in between clients here on his lunch break to get up here with us. So um, we're going to take, I got like two minutes before I got to get him out of here. Uh, Lisa says, great job. She says, well done. She also said she could have done a better job, but you of did course. You did well. Um, we had, uh, I saw one question. So Lion Mar asked, so this was the one seated on the wall doing the wall slide yeah. to progress by standing at the wall first and yes, then work down. So that, that would be um, that would be a great way to start. Um, definitely just try to keep your lumbar spine against the wall. So you can do a little posterior tilt and then try to slide your arms up and down. If you can't do that, create a little bit of space between your lumbar spine and the wall in order to do that movement correctly. And then you can kind of progress to get your back flat and then down into a squat position and then down onto the ground for sure. Cool. Well, we got lots of great comments from everybody. Great job, guys. Thank you. Outstanding. Really useful information. This is really cool, man. Thank you. Thank you for the time. And what a great job putting this whole thing together. You guys, like three days ago, his computer crashed and he had to recreate this entire thing. Text me, panicked, like, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it in time. <laughs> this was fantastic. So thank you so much, brother. Right. I appreciate it. Thank Love you, you man. Thank yeah, you thank too. you for being here. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Uh, we'll get the recording out to you. And uh, we'll send, are, are we okay, Dan, to send them the PDF? Yes. Okay, cool. Yep, we'll get that off. All right, guys, have a good one. We'll talk to you next time. And uh, look for, let's see, we have, so I did a survey out to everybody a couple of weeks ago about doing a pre, uh, pre hip replacement, post hip replacement, and improved quality of strength for life, a three piece series for the hip. And we have overwhelming information and a request for that information. So uh, we are doing that. That will be out in January, starting January 7th. 14th and 21st. So put that on your calendar. Uh, I think we're doing uh, $109 for all three of them and their CEUs attached. Uh, it's going to be 90 minutes each one. We're going all in. Like this is going to be fantastic amount of information. So look for that. You'll see promos. And then uh, TOA Select is coming up. We're shooting for December. We're actually pushing to come in a month earlier because we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I think we're going to be able to get that out to you guys sooner than later. Uh, no promises, but keep an eye out for that. And there was one more thing. Anyway, it'll come in an email. We'll send everything to you guys. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Much respect to everybody. Again, thank you to Dan uh, for being here and for all of you, all of you to, uh, to take the time to be with us. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.